Hi everyone, my name's Victoria Carthew and I'm very happy to be joining you for your lessons today. Get ready because we'll be learning all about text structure and question answer relationships in English. In maths we'll be identifying factors and in science we'll find out about electrical safety. Sit back, make yourselves comfortable and get your thinking caps on and let's get ready to learn. When we're asked to answer questions about something we've read, it can be helpful to think about the type of text we're reading and the type of questions we're being asked. Today, we'll look at text structure and question-answer relationship, or QAR, to help us consider how we can respond to questions about what we've read. Hi everyone, I'm Rebecca. Today, we'll be looking at how knowing the structure of a text can help us answer questions about what we read. Remember, the structure of a text refers to how the text is organised and put together. To look at how the text structure supports meaning, we are going to examine a news report, The Truth About Sharks. An online or written news report has a headline, a summary lead or lead paragraph. Remember, a paragraph contains a group of sentences that connect to explain a central idea, a body and a tail. These text features are the basic building blocks of a news report. Often, a written news report may contain other features, such as images, maps, or diagrams. A headline is a few words that capture the reader's attention and communicates the basic idea of the news report. Let's have a look at our article. Can you identify the headline? This news report's headline is The Truth About Sharks. A summary lead or lead paragraph summarises the basic facts. This paragraph often communicates aspects of the five Ws, who, what, when, where and why, and emphasises the most newsworthy elements of the report. Can you identify the summary lead or lead paragraph in our news report? That's right. The summary lead or lead paragraph for this news report tells us that we will read about Australians' reactions to shark attacks and reasons why this fear may be unfounded, which means not proven at all. The body of a news report gives more detail about the why and the how of the story. It may contain less important information, but it adds detail about the events or topic summarised in the lead paragraph. The body is a mixture of information and quotes, a quote is the exact words that someone has said that add interest to the ideas in a news report. Looking at our news article, we can see that the body is made up of six paragraphs. Take a moment to scan these paragraphs. Can you see some quotes or facts that you find interesting? I find the quote from Dr Crabtree interesting. She says, when people choose to swim in the ocean, they are taking a risk because this territory is the shark's home environment. This is interesting as it is an argument that I have read in different news reports when there are shark sightings or shark attacks. The tail of a news report contains the least important information and can be left out if there is limited space in the publication. Can you identify the tail in our news report? That's right. The tale in this news article says, so next time you're at the beach, spare a thought for the shark, a misunderstood species that needs to be respected and protected by humans. While this paragraph summarises what the news article is about, it could be left out and the reader would still have all the information they need to understand the article. By being familiar with the structure of a news report, we are able to think about where to go to find information that may assist us to answer questions about the article. This is why understanding text structure can be so useful. It is also useful to understand the types of questions we are asked, as this can help us work out how to find the answers we need. QAR, or question answer relationship, is one strategy you may have been taught to help you answer questions about what you have read. Let's review QAR before answering some questions about our news article. QAR uses two levels of questions that help you work out where information can be found. These levels are either in the book or in your head. In the book strategies help answer literal questions 
which means that the answers can be found in the text. There are two kinds of strategies for in the book questions. Answers to write their questions can be found in one sentence of the text and answers are usually one word or a short phrase. You can find the answer by rereading or scanning the text for the keywords that will probably be in the question and in the text. Answers to think and search questions are normally found across several parts of the text. To answer these questions, reread or scan the text to look for related ideas and information. You may even need to summarise your answer using different parts of the text. Some questions need information that is not in the text. In my head, levels of questioning answer inferential questions, that is, questions which require you to infer or read between the lines. The first in my head strategy is author and me, where the answer is partly in the book and partly in your head. The answer comes from fitting together clues from the text with things you already know. You may even need to predict why the author wrote the text and what they attended. The final in my head strategy is on my own. The answer to these questions is not in the text and you may need to make a judgment based on your own prior knowledge. To answer these questions, think about what you know and what you have read before. Let's return to our news report and answer some questions about the text. Since European colonisation of Australia, how many fatal shark attacks have there been? This is a right there question, which means I can probably expect to see some of the words from the question in the text. I know that the body of a news report provides information and quotes. I would expect to find the information about the number of fatal shark attacks in one of the body paragraphs. In this case, look at body paragraph two. So with this in mind, since European colonisation of Australia, how many fatal shark attacks have there been? That's right, there have been roughly 200 fatal attacks. Let's try another question. Why might people's fear of shark attacks be unwarranted? That means undeserved. I don't think the answer to this question is going to be a right there question. And I think there may even be more than one reason in the news report as to why people's fear of sharks is unwarranted. To answer this question, I will have to think and search and look in different parts of the news report. Again, the body paragraphs provide information. So look across body paragraphs two and three. Why might people's fear of sharks be unwarranted? In body paragraph two, we are told that there have been roughly 200 fatal shark attacks since European colonisation, and this is less than one per year. If we move down to body paragraph three, we can see that 121 people drown each year. This means that more people drown each year than are attacked by sharks, meaning our fear of being fatally attacked by a shark may be unwarranted. Our final question requires you to make an inference. To do this, use what you know with what is in the text. How does the tone of the news report, this means the way it sounds and the type of language used, influence the reader? Thinking about the way this news report sounds, I can see that the author feels that sharks are misunderstood. I know this from looking at the headline, which suggests that there are lies or misunderstandings being shared by people, and the use of language like unwarranted and misunderstood. I use this information with my understanding of persuasive language to know that the tone of this report influences the reader to be sympathetic towards sharks. I was able to answer these questions using my knowledge of where information could be found and how I needed to respond based on the type of question I was asked. It really does pay to think about the text structure and type of questions we are being asked when we try to provide an answer to a question about something we have read. To leave you today, I'm going to pose an on my own question that I would like you to consider. There are many dangerous and deadly creatures living in Australia. Do you think people should actively try to interact with these animals? How would you respond to this question?
Hi, welcome back to Learning at Home TV. I love brain teasers, puzzles that really get you thinking. They are a great way to test your skills and have fun at the same time. I gave Brett a puzzle to do that makes him think about multiples and factors. Let's see how he's going. Hi there. I have been given a puzzle, a brain teaser, on this 100 square grid. I have to guess the mystery number with these clues. It's between 20 and 30, and its factors are 3 and 4. Let's remember what factors are and how we might find them. Factors are whole numbers that divide into other whole numbers with nothing left over. For example, 2 can be divided into 12 evenly to get an answer of 6. So 2 and 6 are factors of 12. We can also say that factors are whole numbers that multiply together to make another whole number. For example, 3 times 5 is 15. So 3 and 5 are factors of 15. Let's look at ways we can find factors. Making arrays for numbers helps us find factors of a number. Here are some arrays for 12. This array shows 12 rows of 1. We can turn that around and show 1 row of 12. This array shows 2 rows of 6. We can turn that around to show 6 rows of 2. This array shows 3 rows of 4. We can turn that around to show 4 rows of 3. The numbers in the columns and rows are factors of 12. This means that 12 can be divided equally by all of these numbers. Factors of 12 are 1, 2, 3, 4, 6 and 12. You can also use a multiplication grid. To find the factors of 12, look for the number 12 in the grid. Here we can see 3 and 4 as the shaded numbers at the top and left. So 3 and 4 are factors of 12. Can you see the turnaround fact on the grid? Can you see any other 12s on the grid? Yep, there's one. We can see that 6 and 2 are factors of 12. Can you see the turnaround on the grid? Because this grid only goes up to 10, there are two factors that don't appear. Can you think which ones that they are? Yeah, that's right. It doesn't show 1 multiplied by 12 or 12 multiplied by 1. So it's missing the factors 12 and 1. But if we know our number facts, we can also work out the factors of a number. Start with 1. Think, what can I multiply 1 by to get 12? 1 times 12 is 12. So 1 and 12 are factors of 12. It's helpful to remember that the number itself is always a factor of that number and 1 is a factor of every number. Then move on to 2. What can I multiply 2 by to get 12? 2 times 6 is 12, so 2 and 6 are factors of 12. Next is 3. What can I multiply 3 by to get 12? 3 times 4 is 12, so 3 and 4 are factors of 12. Next 4, well, we've already discovered that 4 is a factor of 12. What about 5? Can I multiply 5 by another whole number to get 12? No, I can't. So 5 is not a factor of 12. Then 6. Well, you get the idea. Now we've identified all the factors of 12. A calculator is a tool that you can use to check factors of numbers. This one's actually an app on a phone. If a number can be divided equally by another number, then this number is a factor. If it does not divide equally to a whole number, then it is not a factor. For example, on this calculator, we can see that when you take 18 
and divide it by 3, the answer is 6. So 3 and 6 are factors of 18. If you start with 18 and divide it by 5, you get a number with a decimal. A decimal is a part of a number left over, so that doesn't count. 5 is not a factor of 18. Now I can have another go at my puzzle. The mystery number is between 20 and 30, and its factors are 3 and 4. I'll start with 20 divided by 3 equals a number with a decimal. No, that's not it. Let's try 21 divided by 3 equals 7, a whole number. Let's try it with 21 divided by 4 equals, no, I get a decimal at the end. That's not going to work. We'll try 22 divided by 3 equals another decimal. That's not right. Let's try 23 divided by 3 equals another decimal. All right. 24 divided by 3 equals 8. Now let's do 24 divided by 4 equals 6, a whole number. That means 24 is a mystery number because 3 and 4 are both its factors. Now, there are two mystery numbers between 10 and 25. They are even numbers. They have the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4 and 6 as common factors. Oh, common factors. Well, common factors are factors that are the same for two or more numbers. Here's an example. The common factors of 10 and 12, well, first we would list the factors of each number and then find the ones that are on both lists. The factors of 10 are 1, 2, 5 and 10. The factors of 12 are 1, 2, 3, 4, 6 and 12. That means 1 and 2 are common factors of 10 and 12 because they're on both lists. Today we discovered that to find factors we can use arrays, multiplication grids, number facts and a calculator. We also found a way to find common factors. Later, why not have a go at my puzzle or try to find the common factors of another two numbers of your choice. See you next time. Yura or hello. My name is Ruby Law and I'm 12 years old. I'm from the Kwanamuka people and I live on Stradbroke Island, also known as Minjuraba. I go to Alexandra State High School, which is located on the mainland. I catch two boats a day just to go to school. My favourite subjects are maths and art because it's like easy to do and I'm really good at timetables. Living on the island, uh, some of my favourite things are playing football, swimming, hanging out with my friends and surfing. As a family, I enjoy walking on the beach at Back Beach, um, collecting yuguris or pippies. When we collect the yuguris, we um, put them on the fire and they crack open. and then we eat them. And then one of my favourite seafoods to eat. I hope everyone's doing okay at home learning. I can't wait to go back to school and see my friends again.
something to think about. Behind the walls, in our devices and out on the street are hundreds of electrical circuits. Today in science, we're going to investigate insulators and conductors and how to stay safe with electricity. Here's David with Electrical Safety. Hi. Previously, we've talked about how the electricity from small batteries like this is quite safe to handle. But the 240 volts from power points can be really dangerous. Now, these devices all have 240 volt electricity inside them. How come it's safe for me to touch them? Today, we're going to explore why. The story of electricity began thousands of years ago. In the sixth century, uh, Talus from Miletus found that by rubbing an object on some fur, he could use it to, small ob um, to move small objects. Let's just see if this works. Yep. So I'm picking up these little pieces of paper. And he tried many different materials. Eventually he found that by rubbing pieces of amber together, he could make sparks, which were eventually called electricity. So electricity's been around for a long time, and as we've learned how to use it more, we've also had to learn how to be safe with it. So we're going to start with our little battery circuit. Just to be safe. Remember these two 1.5 volt batteries add up to three volts. That's still quite safe for me to handle. All right, so I've got a circuit that's got batteries, a switch and a motor. I'll complete the circuit by flicking the switch, which is a paper clip. That's working. But what happens if these wires touch? It stops working. It's because there's the circuit, but now the electricity can take a shortcut. It doesn't, it doesn't have to go through the motor. So that shortcut, we call that a short circuit. And it will make the battery go flat very quickly. It could also get hot and start a fire if we had a higher voltage. Now we can't always keep wires apart in devices. So scientists had to find a way to stop electricity going to places where you don't want it to go. Fortunately, scientists found that electricity can travel through some materials, like this copper wire, but it can't travel through other materials. Materials that allow electricity to flow are called conductors. And materials that don't allow electricity to flow are insulators. Now, I've got some copper wires here. Same as those, but they've been covered with a type of plastic that's an insulator. So watch what happens when I replace them. In our little circuit. I only need one, really. So I'll turn that on. It's working. I touch the wires together. And because it's gelated, we don't have a short circuit. So, so far we know that copper is a conductor and that plastic can be an insulator. Let's test some other materials. We'll use this little switch as a place to test. Normally I'm using a paper clip, so we know that that's a conductor. And if the motor spins, we know it is. If it doesn't spin, we know that the material across there is an insulator. So I'm going to test some of these things. Make a prediction. I'm going to start with a coin. OK. Did you predict conductor or insulator? It works, it must be a conductor. I'm going to try a rubber band. What do you predict? That must be an insulator. Let's try a piece of glass. That must be an insulator too. Um, OK, a little bit of aluminium foil. Yes, conductor. They've got something in common, haven't they? Let's try... Um, I've got this pencil that's got graphite inside it. I'll just take the graphite out. Let's try that. Graphite is a conductor. Plastic. Let's 
see if our Lego man survives. Yep, he's an insulator. What else have we got? Piece of china porcelain. That's an insulator. The blade on my pocket knife. That's the conductor. Okay, finally, one more thing. I'm gonna test my finger. What do you predict? The test shows that my finger's an insulator. But remember, this circuit's only three volts. With a high voltage like 240 volts out of these things, in power point, your body actually can conduct enough electricity for it to be very dangerous. So, once scientists found out what materials were conductors and, or insulators, they could design electrical devices and systems that are safe for us to use. But of course, they're only safe if we use them properly in a way that doesn't let the electricity short circuit. So this drill has got a powerful motor inside and it's got plenty of insulation all around it. But what if I used it in the rain and water got inside? Because water's a bit like my finger. It can be a conductor if the voltage is high enough too. The heating wires inside this toaster, well, they get really hot, so we can't put plastic insulation on them, but they're tucked away inside where they're out of the way. But it would be very dangerous to poke my hand in there. That would let the electricity short circuit. If my toast gets stuck, I pull out the plug and then I use these wooden tongs because wood is an insulator too. I said we should have known wood was an insulator because it's in our tester. Okay, so um, this extension cord, it was under a door and it got jammed and a bit of the insulation has been uh, torn off. Now it still works fine, should I use it? Really dangerous. So um, I'm gonna put this one in the bin. That's about it for today. So let's review what we've learned. We know that some materials conduct electricity and others are insulators. We know that electrical devices use insulation to avoid short circuits and to keep us safe. Now, here's something to try at home. Have a look at the electrical devices around your home. See if you can tell how they use insulation. But don't go poking inside or pulling anything apart. You could make a set of photos that show how different devices are insulated, because there's lots of clever designs that people have developed over time. Have fun. What an interesting way to end today's lessons. Well, that's it for Learning at Home TV, but we have plenty more in store for you because we'll be back every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at the same time. I hope that you'll join us again next time and until then, stay safe and positive and make sure you look out for each other. Remember to stay at home and to keep remembering to wash your hands and, of course, remember those social distancing rules. Bye for now.